Philippa Langley, MBE, or King Finder, as her children called her when she returned from Leicester in 2012, having discovered the bones of Richard III in a car park there, is a world-renowned writer, producer, and Ricardian. Without her exhaustive and painstaking research, the Looking for Richard project would never have happened. Her role in it was subsequently portrayed in the 2022 film The Lost King, starring Steve Coogan and Sally Hawkins as Philippa. Her new book, The Princes in the Tower, sees her rewrite history again, as she shares evidence to suggest the princes in the tower were not killed by Richard III, as has been the widespread belief. Throughout her work, she's encountered skepticism and dismissal, but she's always found a way to keep going, all the while battling chronic ME. That was a real sliding doors moment in my life. I didn't recognise it at the time. I just felt, you know, that my world was imploding. What what takes you from a place of just being intrigued by a person to being now a world-renowned historian? There was a lot that I had to put up with, a lot of scepticism, a lot of ridicule, a lot of personal denigration. But I think if you let something like that get to you, you're never going to achieve what you want to achieve. And I had to actually sit down because I just thought, it doesn't make sense. Philippa, I'm sort of fascinated to know how you would describe yourself, how you think of yourself, because this is called Performance People, this podcast, and we're usually speaking to sports people or people in the world of business, um, people perhaps from the world of finance um, or uh, entertainment, say. But you epitomize a performance person, in my opinion. You think about what it's taken to get you to where you are today and the things that you've done. Um, I feel like determination, rigor, grit, facing adversity and overcoming it, all the things that you associate with performance are sort of you in, in, in one person. And ultimately, performance is all about results, which is, again, something that you can clearly identify with. How, how do you see yourself? I, I think you've covered it a lot in what you said, and that determination. I think I've always had that, and I think my father recognised that, and he always drilled into me, you never give in, you never give up. If there's something you want to do, if there's something, you know, that laser focus that you've got, then um, you don't give in and you don't give up. I don't know if that's a Northern English thing, but certainly for me with my Northern English father, that was very much what he drilled into my psyche as a child. And, and I think that's, I've carried that with me the whole time. And yet the discovery of Richard III, for which you're probably best known, is, is not something that you were always on the path to discover. I mean, an, an illness, a personal illness led you to discover and read more about this, this king and want to know more and effectively has changed the outcome of his story and your own. Tell us a little bit about that and how, and how even that happened. Yeah, that was a real sliding doors moment in my life. I didn't recognize it at the time. I just felt, you know, that my world was imploding because I was very physically active, very physically able. I'd been a feral child. Sport had been my thing my entire life. So even when I started work, I was at the gym and this is going to give you some idea of the, the era that I'm from, but I would be doing aerobics, I'd be doing step classes, I'd be doing strength training, all the while that I had my career going on. But you're right, I was going for my dream job. I was really excited to get this dream job. And I fell ill. And I fell seriously ill. I got Beijing flu, I was wiped out. And I got chronic fatigue from it. So I lost my job. And I lost that, that relationship that I could have with, with being physical and enjoying sport and enjoying that activity. And it all just went. So at the time, it really was like the worst thing that had ever happened to me. But now looking back, if I hadn't have had that sliding doors moment, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. I'd be in my dream job and certainly wouldn't have taken this road. So was it meant to be? I don't know. I don't know. So so what was that like? Just take us back. Like you say, you're on a particular trajectory. 
And then your whole world suddenly, as you, as you say, implodes because of this illness. And, and how long were you set back for? And, and what led you to sort of delve deeper into Richard III and his story? Um, because obviously you're in this situation where you can't be physically active. But how long did that period of time take and, how, and your road to recovery? And then the thing that kept you on this story, you didn't let it go. You kept pursuing it. I, I think it literally was by necessity because I couldn't, I, I was so ill. All that was left for me to do was to read. That's the only thing I could do that didn't totally, totally exhaust me. And so that's when I started reading everything I could about uh, this man, because just before I'd fallen ill, I'd gone on holiday and read a book about him. And I thought I was reading you know, going to be reading about the, the Shakespearean villain, if you like, the psychopath. But actually, I read this book by an American academic who used the contemporary source materials from Richard's lifetime and spoke about this completely different kind of guy. So this really intrigued me because I thought, why do we always speak about this man in terms of the dramatic narrative of his lifetime and not the actual historical materials and evidences from his lifetime. So it was reading. And I just read everything that I could because I could keep my brain going. I couldn't be physically active anymore, but I could compete, keep my brain going. And this was before the internet. So it was about buying books, reading books. And then I joined the Richard III Society in I think it was about 1998 when I joined them. And that was a step up because suddenly I was able to get hold of their archive and read all of these research papers. And that was a big turning moment. That was because suddenly there was so much more information available to me. So it was slow and I had to learn how to manage the illness bit by bit. I mean, what that shows is incredible patience and tenacity. But what, what takes you from a place of just being intrigued by a person to being now a world-renowned historian on that very person and having actually located the site where subsequently his bones were, were brought up to the surface and, and the rest, as they say now, is history? I mean, what, what was that journey like? Because it's one thing to go from you know, reading and being fascinated by a person, it's quite another to lead you to the place where, where you ended up. It was a sense of, it was important. Because I think for me, truth is important. And there were all these stories wrapped around Richard, but also wrapped around his burial, you know, that he was so evil that he'd been dug up and his remains had been thrown into the river. There was no evidence for that story. It was just a story that was tagged onto him in, I think, about the 17th century. So it felt that it was an important thing to do to, if, to try and find his grave, but also to give him a tomb monument, to give him a burial location, and to try and get more knowledge about the actual historical individual out there by doing that. So I think there was a, a determination for sure, but there was a laser focus on that at the time. And, and I think I'm just the kind of person that once I put the blinkers on and once I decide to do something, then the more people that say no, then I just walk around them and try and find doors that will open. And it's just not accepting no, really. It's, it's about ble being really bloody minded. I think at the end of the day. <laughs> it is extraordinary though, because like you say, you did have to face huge, I mean, bearing in mind you're dealing with evidence being the primary thing here and the most important thing here and the truth being told the way, the way it should be told and him being remembered the way that history should remember him. It's, it's interesting because you were met with such skepticism, weren't you? I mean, you mentioned about the people that you had to sort of get around in order to get this done. I mean, how, how problematic was that? And, and what did that take from you <laughs> trying to overcome that adversity? Because it must have been exhausting. It was. It was exhausting. But, you know, I'm a child of the, the 60s and 70s. And 
you know, when you get um, patronized or denigrated, you form um, ways to deal with it. And so you either ignore it or you smile or you laugh or you just, you know, you move on. You, you, you don't do the head on collision with it that probably, you know, young girls would do now, but you didn't then. And so that's kind of what I did. I just had to ignore it because I had to, it wasn't about me. It wasn't about my ego. It wasn't about narcissism. It was about getting a job done. And so I just had to take on board whatever was coming my way in order to get to the end goal. That's all that I had in my mind. And the end goal was getting the tarmac cut to go and search for Richard. Once the tarmac was being cut, then, you know, I was there, job done. And so, yeah, there was a lot that I had to put up with, a lot of skepticism, a lot of ridicule, um, a lot of personal denigration. But I think if you let something like that get to you, you're never going to achieve what you want to achieve. And you just have to sidestep it. You, it just has to be something that is not important to you. And you've just got to get around it. What was really And again, I think it's about energy as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I was just saying, if you spend your energy trying to deal with it, for me, I wouldn't have any energy left for what? I wanted to do. So my, I had to save what energy I had as well. And I suppose you learned that as a result of your illness, right? You probably learned how to channel your energy in the right way. Yeah, it's like being a human battery and you have to, I have to sleep bank in order to, to f complete that battery, fill that battery. And then you, but you reach a point where you know you're getting down in terms of your energy levels. So you have to then conserve it. I couldn't tell. Only friends and very, you know, f friends and family knew that I had chronic fatigue. I couldn't tell anybody about it um, because there was judgments around it then. And it's one of these physical conditions that at that time uh, people did make these judgments and you were seen as like a shirker or somebody who's got something wrong mentally, that sort of thing. I mean, sadly, with long COVID, that's not the case anymore. But at that point, yes. So nobody knew I had it and I had to present as not being ill the whole time, wow. which is there another must, stress. Yeah. yeah, and there must have been huge moments because you had these various different um, key moments over the course of that sort of seven and a half, eight year period where, where, like you say, the stress of one minute you've got the funding for the project, the next minute you don't, and having to go and find the funding again for the project. I mean, there must have been huge moments which potentially could have been triggers. Yeah, absolutely, there was. And stress is definitely a trigger. Getting cold is another trigger. And, and I nearly did give up. There was one point when I'd lost all the funding initially for the dig, and I just thought, I can't do this anymore. I really can't do it. And it was actually my partner, John, who was the one who said to me, he said, look, you've done 99% of the work. You can't give up now. And I thought, he's right. I've got to give it one more go. And that one more go, we got there. So, yeah. They're hugely emotional scenes in a variety of different things I've watched with, with you in them, which depict obviously the moment where the bones were found, whether it be the documentary that you made, which was filming at the time of the discovery, which is remarkable and was able to capture that as it happened, whether it be the film um, and how you've spoken about it subsequently. It must have been the most emotionally bizarre moment when, when the tarmac was cut in exactly the right place where R was placed for the reserved parking in that social services car park in Leicester. I mean, what were the feelings inside you? How did they manifest at that moment in time it must have been this huge relief but at the same time great responsibility with with what was happening yeah it was a real mixture of emotions and again it was hugely stressful because a lot of the the people who were involved with the dig and the search for Richard really just thought it was a complete wild goose chase and you know they you know, looking for the church was good, that that was worthwhile, but forget it in terms of Richard III. So 
And then the first thing we find, um, you know, within a few hours of the dig is we find the lower leg bones in the exact place where I thought the king would be, where my research confirmed that the church likely was and the choir. And, you know, again, they sort of, and I understood it, you know, the archaeologist said, look, it's the first find. We don't know where we are yet. We don't even know if we're in the Greyfriars area. We just have to cover them up and, and carry on. I understood that. But by the time we got to the halfway point of the dig and we now knew that this was the possible location of the church. And although they said, look, it's that's the nave, it's too far, it's too far west, that's not the, you know, where these remains are, that's not the choir. And I disagreed. Um, but luckily as the client, I could instruct exhumation of those remains and then pay for them because I had a bit of money left. So again, it was um it it was that laser focus and that was my my hot area my key area so i thought i'm going to spend the last bit of money that i have left in getting these remains examined and exhumed and they were those of the king and how did you feel you're standing there in this social services car park seven and a half years after this research has started with various ups and downs along the way and the possibilities of this never unfolding in the way that you hope it might. And yet there it is. It's there. The king is there. I mean, how on earth did that make you feel in that moment when you're standing on top of that tarmac and peering into that trench and, and seeing what you're seeing? It was it was overwhelming, but probably not for the reason that you think it was overwhelming, because I kind of... Thank you.